Good afternoon, Marines. Good afternoon, sir. Okay, thanks for being here. My name is Chaplain David Dupre, and I'm here to talk to you about suicide prevention and intervention. This is a subject that is absolutely vital to our force, and it's vital as we gain tools to inter intervene in the lives of persons who might be at risk. All right, so as we begin this conversation, we might want to ask the question, why am I standing before you? And I'm standing before you because I'm a person who has a story, and I'm a person who has passion for this subject. And that is why Training Command and the people here have asked me to provide this teaching to you today. All right, so my story has to do with my brother. And my brother's loss has provided passion in my life. But how many of you have been affected by suicide in some way in your lives? Would you raise your hands, please? Okay, so as we look around the room, and you can put your hands down, I would say to you that you have a story as well. And even those who did not raise their hands have had significant loss. Well, I've simply managed to take my story and turn my story into passion, all right? Because when my brother died, I asked myself a question, and that was, because of the loss of my brother, do I now live as half a person, or do I now live for two people? And you've not known me for very long, but what do you think I chose to do? Two people. Yeah, two people, exactly. And do you see how that question and that answer has turned into passion? <laughs> so I still, when my, my brother died 21 years ago, and I purchased a motorcycle from his estate. The motorcycle still runs, and when I go back to Wyoming, I ride it with my hair on fire. All right, in the Bighorn Mountains, going fly fishing, and living life hugely so that I can live it for me, and I can live it for him. That's passion. So I want to say to you that you have a story as well, some kind of story, and most of us have experienced significant loss. And it's possible that you can ask that same question, and you can turn loss into passion and that passion can be used to intervene in the life of someone else. All right? And I want to ask you another question. So I sort of want to ask you, do you have passion? Because I know you have a story. And then I want to ask you another question. And this question comes from a recently retired Sergeant Major from the Marine Corps named Michael Jones. And I hope that sometime in your life you'd have a chance to meet Michael Jones. He retired as the Mar 4 Com Sergeant Major. It's hard to get much higher than that unless you're Sergeant Major of the Marine Corps. All right? And the key point of leadership for Sergeant Major Michael Jones is this. It is this question. Are you willing to be inconvenienced for the other Marines and the people around you, the people in your fire team, whether they be service members or even civilians? Are you willing to be inconvenienced? And one time I had the opportunity to stand in a much larger auditorium than this with the crew of the Abraham Lincoln. So we had about 2,500 people on board, huge auditorium, and we had about half the crew in this auditorium. And they knew me, I knew them, we had sailed around the world together, and I asked them this question. They weren't expecting it. I said, raise your hand, and don't do this now, but I asked them, raise your hand if you'd be willing to die for me. And there was just a couple of seconds that went by, and almost every hand shot up. I said, thank you. That's great. And then I asked this question. Okay, great. Let me ask you another question. How many of you would be willing to be inconvenienced for me? And guess what happened? There was a longer delay and about half as many hands went up. So, so you'd be willing to die for me, but you have to ask yourself whether you'd be willing to be inconvenienced for me, because everybody wants to be a hero. Oh, sure, I'll stand in front of a bullet for you. I'll jump on a grenade for you. But inconvenience is the key to intervention. And if you're not, being, if you're not able to be inconvenienced, then you simply cannot intervene in the life of a person who is at risk. So all of us, have a story, the question is whether we can turn it into passion and whether we'll, we're willing to be inconvenienced. Now, as we look at the current Marine Corps training, there is, there is a basic fundamental suicide prevention program that is called UMAPIT, Unit Marine Awareness and Prevention Integrated Training. You will, be, you will not be quizzed on that, all right? UMAPIT. And in that UMAPIT program, we check the box for suicide prevention and it is a great program. What this is designed to do is take the principles of UMAPIT and to go farther with it and to go deeper with it 
and to interact with you and to get people thinking more along those concepts. And the central piece of you map it is this acronym R-A-C-E, or RACE. And what does the R stand for? Recognize. Okay, recognize. What does the A stand for? Ask. Okay, and what does the C stand for? Care. And what does the E stand for? Escort. An escort. Okay, so let's start at the beginning. Let's just talk about recognize. All right, so what are we looking for? If a person looks normal, if there's nothing going on, we wouldn't necessarily ask them any questions. But you've brought your gear with you this afternoon. All right, and could I, could I borrow some gear? All right, would you just hand me a couple of packs? Would you guys? So this wouldn't be, this wouldn't be unusual, right? But if, if a person was, you know, maybe had a couple more, That'd be a little unusual, so let's have some more. Let's see. Can I have yours? Let's see here. I need. All right, let's go. Let's see. Yeah, let me, let me have a few more. So this is start getting a little unusual, right? If somebody's walking down passageway like this, but I can still carry more, right? I can probably, I can make this pretty effective. So let's have a few more. So toss them to me. Right? So this person, you, you might want to ask this person if they need a little help, right? Yes, yes, yes. And you probably would. You'd probably say, uh, you need a hand with that? Or something to that effect, okay? So if, we're, if this conversation is about suicide prevention, all right, and now I'm demonstrating to you by the look on my face and the way I'm carrying myself that I've got a little bit more than I can carry here, then we're going to start to recognize that, right? So if we're thinking about suicide and we're thinking about warning signs, we're thinking about risk factors, we're thinking about triggering events, what kind of things might you see in someone else? Could you offer something up? Yeah. Mood swing thing. Okay, you might see a mood swing. What else? Yeah. Isolation stress. Isolation. All right, what else? Yeah. Depression stress. Depression. What else? Selling personal items, okay? Change what? Personality. Change of personality. All right. What else? Yeah. Making amends with people. Making amends with people. All right, terrific. Well, by the way, this is starting to get a little heavy, but I could probably still carry some more. So why don't I have a few more? Let's go. Load me up here. All right. Okay, um, I, need a, I need a few more. I can still carry more. So would you all bring me those up here? Let's see. Just throw them on top any way you can. All right. And I'm going to get to a point where if somebody hands me one more thing, what am I going to do? I'm going to drop the whole thing. All right. And if you're looking at me carefully, and you're observing how I'm carrying my load, you might be able to tell that I'm in a place <laughs> where if somebody gives me one more thing, I'm going to drop the whole bundle. All right, so for right now, I'm just going to put these down and let that be symbolic. All right. So what did you just give me? Repeat what you said so far. Go ahead. Yeah. Make amends. Making amends. Mood, swing Mood swings. Isolation. Isolation. Depression. Depression. Selling, personal Selling personal items. Change of personality. Change of personality. Drug and alcohol use. Drug and alcohol use, which would be of an of a abuse. If it's legal on the alcohol side, we're gonna we're gonna observe the way we carry ourselves. If it's illegal or using illegal drugs, then we're going to notice that. And we're going to see that within our fire teams. Thank you. What else? Yes? Physical appearance or hygiene. Okay, physical appearance or hygiene. And sometimes it, it goes, it doesn't always go toward becoming a soup sandwich. Okay? Because sometimes the person actually makes the change because it's change we're talking about, right? In every single one of these things, we're talking about a significant change going on in the life of someone else in our fire team. And if it's a change, we're going to notice it. But sometimes the person gets their act together. Why? They want to be comfortable with what they're going to do. 
Yeah, they want to be comfortable with what they're about to do. They're getting their act together. So whether it's a, a warning sign, something we see, or whether it is, it is a triggering event, something that occurred to them, or it's, it's something that they're carrying around with them, we want to be able to observe that and ask about that. Now, would you immediately ask about suicide? Like right straight away? Okay, what would you ask? Okay, so is there anything wrong? Right. You would have asked me, can I help you carry some of that, right? You would say, hey, look, I see that you're carrying around a lot of stuff. Can I help you with that? And if you mean it and you ask sincerely and within your fire team you have trust, the person's going to tell you exactly what they're carrying. And is it possible that you can help them carry some of that? Yes. Sir. yes. Okay, now is it possible, think about the things that were just mentioned, that there's something here you cannot help them carry? Okay, someone mentioned depression. All right, are, are you a therapist? No. <laughs> okay, so what we have to do is recognize that as they unpack all the layers that they're carrying, some of those things we can take action to. And you know what? That's going to make a huge difference. If you just carry one thing and help them carry that one thing, it's going to make a huge difference. But what we have to do is also recognize that there are things that they're carrying that we know that we need to make referrals to other people who care. All right? And that's all the process of recognition. All right? So let's move on to asking. We begin to, to move into asking when I said, what would you ask in, in a preliminary manner? And we call that walking on the target, right? So you're concerned that, hey, you know, this person could possibly be at risk for suicide, but I'll begin to ask a few caring questions and just see what happens. And let's just say that you've walked on the target, and it's me, and I'm a friend of yours, and I'm in your fire team, and every question that you ask makes you a little bit more concerned that I might be at risk for suicide. How would you ask a question that is direct and that hits the target? Okay, are you thinking about killing yourself? You see, I can't get out of that question. And if we have a trust relationship, I have to say yes or I have to say no. And you know what? Usually, I'm going to give you a very honest answer. But I want to take a minute and talk about what makes a good question and what makes a not so good question. So if you would have asked me instead of, are you thinking about killing yourself? If you would have said, you're not going to do something stupid, are you? Is that a good question? Okay, why is it not a good question? What is it? Vague. vague. What else is it other than vague? Well, yeah. Okay, they might think it's the right thing to do, but what's the attitude of the person asking the question? Sarcastic. What is it? Sarcastic it's sarcastic. What else? It's demeaning. Thanks. It's asked in passing, and, and passing, and it doesn't show that you care. All right. Excellent. Let me give you another example now. What if, what if I said, you're not thinking about hurting yourself, are you? Sounds pretty good. Why, why would that not be a good question? Okay. It's not straight to the point. He could do it instantly, right? And the fact is that I might already have enough hurt in me anyway, I'm thinking about ending my life in such a way that I'm going to take away the hurt. You see how it's not direct? And it's possible to sidestep the question. Okay? So how about if I asked this question? Have you ever thought about suicide? What's wrong with that question? It's past tense. It's not what you're thinking right now. It's past tense. It's not now. It's not current risk. What else? It sounds like a suggestion. It sounds like a suggestion? Okay. Have you, okay, thank you. All right. And, and it could be something that occurred. So it's possible that the person could have been at risk, let's say, as a teenager. They received help. Everything's good. And now I just asked them a suicide question, and they just said yes to it. So now I'm green on green, and now what do I have to do? I have to report it. I have to refer, because I'm not quite sure what I got myself into now. So can you see why it's absolutely vital to ask a good question? All right? So the character, characteristics of a good question are that it's current, it assesses current risk, that it's direct, and it's to the point, that it doesn't assume that you're going to say yes or no, right? and that it's demonstrated with care. Those are the things that we think about when 
we're in a position, and I believe that sometime in your life, especially if you're recognizing, you may be in a position in your life where you will have to ask that direct question. All right, so we recognize, we ask, we care. When do you think you stop caring? Never stop caring. Okay, but there's this escort piece. All right, so for every good question, when there's a yes answer, there must be an escort. You must refer them somewhere. All right, and, but we never stop caring. Now, lastly, who do we refer those people to? Chaplain, who else? Chain of command. Chain of command. Who else? Suicide hotline. Suicide hotline. Excellent. Who else? Okay, spouse or family member. What else? Squad leaders. Squad leaders. Part of the chain of command. Fabulous. And what about the docs? Okay, the corpsmen. You have trusted corpsmen. You have trusted medical. You have marine and family life consultants, counselors who are embedded in your units or other behavioral health people. All of those people that you just mentioned are the people to whom we escort those who are at risk. But I'll tell you what, I need your partnership. All right, can you see why I'd say that? Because you're gonna go into spaces, you know, when I was on an aircraft carrier, we had 2,000 spaces. I couldn't get to all those spaces. But the sailors and Marines could. All right, in your various commands, there will be rooms and places and spaces and buildings where chaplains and counselors might never go. And that's why I ask you today to seriously consider taking these tools and putting them in practice and partnering me, with me in this effort. Because I'll tell you, if you are willing to be inconvenienced for the sake of another person, and if you are willing to recognize, ask, care, and escort, I will tell you, that you will successfully intervene in the life of another person and you will save a life. And that is why I'm here. So God bless you. Thank you for your attention. Hurrah. Hurrah.